Um, it is fair to say that few topics are as widely discussed in HR, talent management, as generational differences. And uh, on the one hand, if you take a helicopter view of this and look at the big picture, this is totally absurd, right? Homo sapiens have existed for over 200,000 years. Even if you look at the wider uh, time frame since the universe or the world as we know it existed, you know, sapiens have been around for not even two minutes. And, uh, you know, why then focus on such a granular and detailed aspect of human behavior, particularly if we're still not able to leverage our understanding of people in general to solve most of the problems that organizations have? Is it an excuse to actually dismiss the knowledge that we have on people in general, or maybe blame a particular generation that isn't even in charge yet for the problems that organizations have? Those are questions that I wondered myself. Uh, on the other hand, it is also true that even in fairly short peri periods of time, even in like, if you take time frames of like 100 years, which in the realm of human evolution is a tiny fraction, um, there are visible changes in human behaviors, attitudes, and competencies. Uh, whether you look at the world of fashion, art, uh, communication, media, architecture, even music. Can you imagine in 100 years, we went from Rachmaninoff to Justin Bieber? <laughs> what will happen in 100 years from now? that will make people look back onto Justin Bieber and regard him as a, an academic, intellectual kind of bastion of music, <laughs> as we do with Rachmaninoff now. You know? So evolution can sometimes devolve, but changes are remarkable. So in that sense, it makes sense to look at cohort differences. And you know, uh, some have argued that the cutoff points that we use to group or kind of lump people into buckets are somewhat arbitrary. They tend to be kind of driven not so much by actual population trends or kind of birth patterns of trends, but by historical events and really changes in what we could safely refer to as the consumeristic society. Okay, so um, uh, led by ICF and lots of organizations, um, there's some really interesting research that you will have access to. Talk to ICF and I will provide a link to the whole findings. There's about 40 pages summarizing the results. I'm only going to show you two slides with these results and then kind of move on. So that's the good news. Uh, but in total, 670 participants um, answered questions pertaining values, style, attitudes, and personalities that should hopefully help us understand how millennials and other generations should be managed, and even more importantly, how they will manage. I think from the perspective of readiness, if we're thinking about whom to promote, whom to invest in, it's very important to start looking at the bigger picture, not just at, as a technical expertise. Great and you know, well-known cartoon from The New Yorker assessing these issues. It's kind of remarkable that still in most organizations, potential uh, is a function of past performance, and that mostly promoting people involves moving them away from tasks they do really well and putting them in roles that they're probably not so good at or not so interested in, right? Um, so as the famous Peter principle suggests, um, everybody eventually rises to their own level of incompetence or mediocrity, right? So if you've been long enough in an organization, your potential is where you are minus one role, because if you're no longer worthy of promotion, you should have stayed where you were before, okay? So I think it's, it's certainly from a coaching uh, perspective and human capital perspective, it, it's a welcome trend and a healthy trend that people have now uh, realized or become more aware um, as to the importance of soft skills. So let's look at a couple of the findings. First, what are organizations doing to attract, develop, and retain millennials? And in particular, what makes for an exciting or an enticing work environment for millennials? Um, I'm upset that I missed Francesca Gino's presentation today. I'm a big fan of her work. 
and especially her work in the area of rebel talent, if you think about it, that's pretty much the paradigm that explains preferences in this generational cohort. What millennials want is flexible work arrangements, pretty much as those found in the gig or sharing economy in a way. Uh, there's clear data indicating that comparatively to other generations, a higher proportion of uh, millennials are interested in entering self-employment or at least supplementing full-time jobs with other forms of employment. And if they can have flexibility within their full-time job, that's ideal. They also want more developmental opportunities. You know, everybody wants an opportunity to learn and unleash their curiosity. But for millennials, this hungry mind or thirst for kind of learning is higher. And they also are more needy in terms of recognition. They want to be recognized for the achievements. So in a way, it's a profile similar to that found in social entrepreneurs. Uh, they want jobs that enable them to have impact, make the world a better place, but also enable them to learn and uh, have flexibility or freedom. What about values? And here I'm showing comparison between millennials in, and generation Z, Z, so we're already talking now about the next generation, and I was just talking to some colleagues in, during the break, and I said we probably have maybe one or two years of millennial bashing, and then millennials can start bashing the next generation, you know. Um, so not long to go, particularly if you are millennials in the room, then you can take revenge soon and talk about the next one. But there are important patterns here. Sometimes what we attribute to one generation is simply a continuation of uh, a trend that can be seen throughout the last, let's say, 10 decades or so. So in blue and kind of a lighter blue, you, you have Generation Z, or also called the Homeland Generation, and all millennials. Some counterintuitive findings from the survey. So they actually prefer to work with people who are higher in tradition and respect authority, so they are more hierarchical in their value preferences as to what type of cultures and organizations they want to work in. They also don't care that much about values alignment, working in a place that kind of uh, exposes or where the culture is uh, congruent with their own values. They also don't care that much about whether there is a transparent path to leadership or not. And most importantly, they want to be promoted very quickly. Uh, a couple of books that I can reference vis-a-vis uh, -vis this last finding. Uh, my colleague Ben Dutner wrote a couple of years ago a very good book called Credit and Blame about how people, it's about organizational politics, but about, it's a, there's a very good section on generational differences in kind of entitlement and expectations uh, at work. And on, on my flight here, I was reading one of the best books I read recently, uh, Homo Deus by Yuval Hariri, I really, really recommend this book. It's cynical and apocalyptic, so not something you'll pick up if you want to be cheered up, but he makes a really fascinating description of what he calls the modern age. He says, in the modern age, which is also the humanist age we're living in, the deal is very simple. We resigned to meaning in exchange for power. And all the progress in the world depends on the kind of closer symbiosis between science and business, which is transitioning sapiens to the next generations. We want to be amortal, we want to engineer happiness, and we want to consume as much as possible. But actually, we're giving up meaning in that sense. So if there is a trend here that suggests that uh, people are becoming more transactional, more pragmatic, and perhaps even learning machines at work, that is uh, in line with kind of a, the wider development of where culture is going in general. So I think it's important to try to draw uh, some sociological insights from this. What does the wider psychological literature or science say in this? And Jean Twenge from the University of California, South California, has done a lot of work on generational differences. Some very important meta-analysis where she actually disentangles the effects of age and the effects of generations, you know, uh, drawing from interesting data that essentially you need to ask the same questions to people in the same age buckets through the times. Okay, so imagine we ask 20 or 30 year olds the same question today and in the 80s and in the 50s, so you need to use archival data for this. Some very interesting findings 
um, summarized in this table. So on average, what she calls Generation Me, so millennials, tend to have lower levels of work centrality. So work is not that much of a central aspect or element in their lives, okay? Um, there are obviously other lives, even if we spend more time working than socializing or with families or having fun, uh, but this varies from generation to generation. Also lower levels of work ethic, and she also makes a very interesting distinction here that even though aspirations increase, work ethic goes down. That is one of the problematic kind of uh, elements of what we sometimes refer to as entitlement. And at the same time, higher levels, dispositional levels of job satisfaction. So on average, they're more engaged at work. This is good news, especially if engagement translates into higher levels of performance. And then the one that has been discussed probably more widely, not just in her research and not just in US samples, but in general, individ individualistic tendencies going up. So individualism has been rising over the past 100 years. This echoes other findings by her and colleagues on the systematic increases in narcissism and entitlement over the past eight or 10 decades. Some fascinating data, especially from the US, on what we call the NPI. This is the Narcissistic Personality Inventory. So it's actually used to diagnose clinical levels of narcissism, okay? Um, and uh, even though this might look like a minor change is not trivial, it's strongly significant. And you know, if you look at human dispositions, traits, or values, typically over five, eight, 10 decades, you don't, you don't find dramatic or categorical changes. So to, be, to give you an example of the sort of questions that are part of this self-report inventory, uh, I am destined to be famous. In the 1930s, something like 25 or 30% of people said yes, endorsed that item. In the 1950s, it was around 40, 45%. In the 80s, it was about 70%. Now it's 85%. Okay, so 85% of people in their 20s to 30s answer yes to the question, I am destined to be famous. Okay? Um, and so that's interesting. I think even if you look at, we, we often assume that uh, certain things are totally novel and a product of kind of current trends and culture and that they never happened before. And actually, it's important to look at things from a bigger perspective, right? It's perspective. So even if we look at kind of uh, the culture or phenomenon of uh, trashy celebrity fandom, right? Like Kim Kardashians and Kanye West of the world. Like we tend to think it's like, wow, it's a sad state of affairs if we're living um, you know, in a culture or an era where if you want to be famous, it's almost better not to have any talents. If you have a talent, <laughs> it's kind of, uh, it, it works against you, right? If you're famous for doing something well, like, I don't know, Roger Federer or Serena Williams, uh, oh, well, you know, it's boring. Whereas if you're just famous for being famous, wow or for having millions of followers, it's like, that's really something to embrace. And again, if you, if you look at it from a kind of a more longitudinal basis or a big picture perspective, first of all, there's nothing new. It's just that we habituate to certain things and then we need inflation of certain traits to, to make something noticeable and actually to even react to that, right? So um, do you remember Paris Hilton? but you don't see her very much these days, right? And it's, it's interesting because in the late 90s or early noughties, it's like, oh, Paris Hilton, the, the generation of mankind, right? It's like, oh, who pays attention to this? And now, you know, she kind of looks quite intellectual, philosophical, <laughs> compared to Kim Kardashian, who, by the way, she mentored, right? So from a mentorship perspective, it's like, a good example of the disciple being better than the master, right? And, and if you go back to the 50s and you look at, you know, celebrities then like 50s, 60s, Marilyn Monroe, uh, yes, she would feature in Playboy, but Playboy had, you know, Nobel Prize winning uh, writers of literature writing their contributions. So, it was, so I think it's, it's important to look back and see the connection and also think, where are we going? You know, again, where are we going? Much like I said, 
who will be the Justin Bieber equivalent in 100 years, you know, who will be the Kim Kardashian of 100 years from now that will make us look back at Kim as a kind of bastion of intellectual brilliance and <laughs> metaphysical insights. Um, so let me just say a few more things on this narcissism uh, phenomenon, which I think is very interesting. And you know, in, as, uh, uh, I think in psychology, one could argue to a certain extent that uh, it's, it's all footnotes to Freud, or at least you know, if, if you find something that is relevant, whether we're looking at organizational psychology or human behavior in general, Freud probably wrote about it, right or wrong, data-driven or intuitively. Um, and Freud, of course, wrote a lot about narcissism and especially about the connection between narcissism and leadership. I think this is something that is interesting to reflect on, especially if the question, uh, if we accept that some of this is true and it's representing a meaningful change in average dispositions, right? We're not saying everybody is narcissistic. There's always a normal distribution. People are low, most average, some high. But this means that scores are shifting to the right or to the left in, in some traits. If we accept that, on average, generations and people are becoming more narcissistic, then the question is, how should we manage those people who, on average, are more entitled, more individualistic, care less about working hard, and expect to be promoted more? And secondly, how will those people manage and lead? You know, and I think that is a valid question. That is a valid question, and there's sufficient data to justify that question. And so I want to go back to Freud here. About 100 years ago, he wrote a very interesting essay on leadership and narcissism. And Freud saw a very direct connection between the two. He basically said, well, you know, um, uh, ascribing to an evolutionary view of leadership, um, he acknowledged that um, leadership is an essential function, an essential psychological process that enables people to get along in order to get ahead, right? So if you put people together and you give them a task, if those individuals want to work as a high-performing team, they need to get along with each other in order to get ahead of other teams. So essentially, Freud said leadership is about inhibiting or suppressing individuals' narcissism. If you can at least temporarily extinguish the me, 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 me mindset that characterizes individuals uh, at you know, uh, various points in time, then they can be more other-oriented, other-focused, and work as a high-performing way. So obviously, that will be harder if you have people who, on average, are more narcissistic. It will be harder. I used to, I'm, I'm a soccer fan, so I used to uh, use as uh, analogy uh, Real Madrid, who for many years was obsessed with winning the European Champions League. And their approach was to hire all these overpaid divas who were all A players, and they couldn't function as a team. Now, Paris Saint-Germain is in, in the similar kind of, an, unfortunately, Real Madrid has won a lot of trophies recently, so I can't use that analogy anymore. But they also changed their strategy. So that's, it's clear that it will be harder to turn a group of people into a high-performing team if people are inherently more narcissistic. And as to the question of how they will lead, that's even more problematic. How are you going to get a leader to not be self-centered and worry or care about the well-being of the team if they are more narcissistic? If they are more narcissistic, can we? One solution, of course, is that they achieve something great through their teams. But if they're so obsessed with themselves and so focused on themselves that they don't care uh, about the well-being or welfare of the team, and they can't empathize, and they're very focused on themselves, then that's going to be harder.